Hey there folks, how you doing today? Welcome back to the channel. Please bear with any background racket that you might hear throughout this production. We are on location where life happens and sometimes there's stuff going on out there that interferes with what we're trying to do in here. This is another segment of our UFO content that is our unfiltered fans only content that we do here on this channel. For those of you that are familiar with the channel and have seen these before, you know that this is something that I do for you people, the regular viewers of the program. If you're new to the program and just now checking it out, we invite you to stay. Hopefully you'll have some fun with this. We have done two of these so far recently under the UFO content, and this will be part three, which is basically top five list of firearms, and they all share a common theme. The first episode was the top five guns we regretted getting rid of. The second episode was the top five guns we regretted not getting. And this, the third part, will be the top five guns I regretted getting in the first place. So now that we got the introduction out of the way, let's move into the list. I wrote all this down this morning while I was drinking my coffee. I've got several pages here. I'm actually going to be reading because I don't want to miss anything. So it's going to be more of a story format than what some of the content here is. And also, as those of you that are familiar with the UFO content know, editing in this portion is kind of minimal. So there might be some pauses or breaks in the content. Just bear with it if you can. Also, this is a top five list. We have to start somewhere and end somewhere. Just know that they're not in any particular order except for the very last one on the list. And as all the kids these days try to do, we do have an honorable mention in there as well. Moving right into our list with the number five position, the SIG P220. In my youth, I wanted one because of, you know, the global uh, military and police history of the weapon. I was really big into 45s at the time, and I wanted something a little less boomer than a 1911. So about 20 years ago, give or take, maybe a little over 20 years ago, I saved my pennies, a lot of them, and purchased a new copy for the low, low price of about $700 along with a couple of boxes of hardball ammunition. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with the term hardball ammunition, what hardball concerning a 45 is, was 230 grain full metal jackets. That's what the military used to use in the 45. And it obtained the unofficial designation of hardball, probably because that's kind of what it looked like. Uh, picked up a couple of boxes of hardball, and a box of federal hydroshocks, and that's going to be real important here in a minute. So I invited my old boomer buddy, who was big into 1911s, out to the range. And, well, he showed up, and he showed me up. Uh, when he showed up, he had a pair of 1911s with him. I had fired both of those pistols in the past. One was a Kimber Custom Target II. The other was a Rock Island Armory GI copy, just... Uh, for those of you that aren't aware of it, Rock Island many years ago started making guns off of some old Colt equipment over in the Philippines. They import them here. They're cheap, but they're really good. I have one in there that I've won competitions with. So I knew that both of those pistols were capable of exceptional accuracy as well as they were both extremely reliable. Fact of the matter is, I had been encouraged by my buddy to buy a 1911. And I had also been encouraged by the same guy not to buy the SIG P220. Now, the P220 had a double action, single action trigger with plenty of slop and over travel. And try as I might, I couldn't come close to the accuracy of the Browning single actions. But to add insult to injury, I couldn't find the P220 to feed reliably with anything other than the hardball ammunition that we had mentioned. The Federal Hydroshocks wouldn't feed. Uh, we had some lead round nose and some lead semi wad cutters that he had loaded up that neither of those would feed. I think we went to the shop at the range and purchased another box or two of some different types trying to get them to feed. The only thing that that pistol would feed reliably was the hardball ammunition. So I sent it back to SIG and several weeks later I got it back with a new barrel installed. Well, it still wouldn't feed right. So the end result of that one was I took it back to Tricky Dick, that same guy that we talked about in part two of this video series, took it back to him and I traded it in on a Ruger GP100 and a Winchester uh, Lever Action 3030 
both of which I still have, and both of which, arguably, at least in my mind, were better weapons than that SIG P220. So moving on to number four on our list was the Smith & Wesson CS40 Chief Special. Low capacity and painful to shoot would summarize what we had with the Chief Special. Smith & Wesson made them in the late 90s up until about 2002. At the time, the 40 cal was all the rage of the age, and everyone with their ear to the ground in the firearms community, including yours truly, felt that they needed that in their life. Here's how it went down. My boss at the time read about it in a magazine and decided that he had to have it. So he paid a premium to get his hands on one, only to realize that it was a hot potato in that the longer you held it in your hand, the more painful it became of an experience. Voicing his displeasure at the recent acquisition, he told me of his woes. Having never fired it, I decided that he was just a big baby and that I would capitalize on his frustration by offering him peanuts for it, just to take it off of his throbbing hands. Now, I don't remember what I offered him for it, but I think maybe if memory serves me, I agreed to work an extra day every week for like a month or something like that. I was cooking in his restaurant at the time, but he jumped on the offer and soon enough it was mine. Well, it didn't take very many rounds through it to figure out that it was a real stinger and that I was never going to enjoy the experience shooting it. So I traded it in to Tricky Dick again for a Minnesota State Patrol police trade-in Beretta 96D Centurion double action only pistol. Now I have to tell you that I got the better end of that bargain as well. With that 96D Centurion in mind, let that be the segue into the third weapon on our list today. Number three was a direct result of the acquisition of that Beretta. The Keltec Sub 2000 40 cal with Beretta 96 mag compatibility. The Beretta 96D quickly became one of my favorite handguns, still is. So I was ecstatic when I learned that the all new Keltec Sub 2000 being offered in 40 cal was available with matching magazines. So as soon as I was able to get my hands on one, I added it to my arsenal, figuring it would be the ideal companion for my beloved Beretta. Before the kel haters begin banging away on their keyboards, let me set the record straight about this peculiar little firearm. It worked well and was reliable. It just wasn't for me. The copy that I had, talking about the Sub 2K, was one of the earliest offerings, and it didn't have the rails on the forend or the higher sights found on the second generation weapons. The combination of the ridiculously low sights and my larger than most head made it nearly impossible for me to utilize the optics without smashing my face down hard into the buffer tube and I normally came away from a range session with a bruise across the side of my face. Now my little brother, who resembles a normal sized person, had no issues acquiring the sights so I gave him that little fold-up rifle along with the Beretta 96 II. He still has them, and when I go see him, I'll shoot them just for the sake of shooting it. Now, I'll tell you, that Sub-2000 was a really good weapon, and the second-generation ones fixed a lot of what was wrong with the first ones. But suffice it to say, it just wasn't for everyone, and it wasn't for me. So moving on to number two on our list was my Magnum Research 50 caliber Desert Eagle. The Deagle, as I affectionately called it, was a love-hate relationship from the start. I loved the idea of ownership. I loved the fireball that exploded with the pull of the trigger. I even have one of those captured. Uh, it's on the channel banner here on our channel. I'll put it up there so you can see it. It was a blast to shoot and fun to take to the range. What I hated about it was the cost of ownership. Not counting the many monies that it cost me just to add it to the stable was the $3 plus a round that it cost to pull the trigger. Now, I hand-loaded for it, which helped out a little bit, but range sessions always set me back more than I cared to admit. Add to that the absolute impracticality of using it as anything other than a range toy with bragging rights, and you'll see why I no longer have it in my collection. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, no top five list would be complete without an honorable mention. Hang on. I got to go get it. All right, folks, I'm back. Now, no top five list would be complete without an honorable mention. This one was selected for the honorable mention, not because it is any less regrettable than any of the others, but simply because it is the only weapon on this list that I still own, still have in my possession. Uh, I present to you the Ruger LCR in 38 Special plus P. I'll show you real quick. This is a safe and empty weapon. No ammunition for it out here in our workspace. At 13.5 ounces, the LCR only weighs about a half an ounce more than a can of Dr. Pepper and about a half an ounce less than a Glock 42 with an empty magazine. Its lack of mass led Ruger to include Hogue Tamer Grips as factory equipment. And while I'm sure that they help, the snap of recoil with a hot defensive load designed for a short barreled performance is punishing. The double action only trigger slap makes sure that the one part of your hand not involved in absorbing recoil manages to end the range session just as sore as the rest of it. Now, while the only way to describe the shooting experience with the LCR is unpleasant, one might wonder why it remains as part of my collection. While I'm not at liberty to discuss certain things here on this platform, suffice it to say that this weapon served me well as a backup weapon for years and now deserves a space in my safe to live out the rest of its days. Okay, moving on to number one on our list. Uh, while these were listed in no particular order, as I mentioned at the beginning, if I had to assign a numerical value to the regerts factor, this one would indeed hold the position of number one. The last weapon on my list and the only rifle is, was my DPMS LR308 with the Bear Creek Arsenal 20 inch stainless steel mid profiled barreled side charging upper. What started out as an inexpensive addition to my collection turned into a money pit and a huge amount of frustration. It also fell into one of those cases where it becomes less about the money involved and more about the principle of things. Basically, I was sold a rifle at a fair price, assuming that it was a functioning weapon. Unfortunately, it was anything but. I found out later that the person that I purchased it from was well aware that it was no good and didn't bother to mention any of that to me before I bought it. The mistake that I made was assuming that if there was something wrong with it, he would have told me about it before I handed over the money. Now, due to some events that were occurring at the time that I was trying to get this weapon right, the cost of everything I purchased to try to fix it wound up being at a premium. After a few hundred dollars in replacement parts, in an attempt to salvage the project, I purchased a complete new upper from Bear Creek Arsenal at the late 2020 Kung Flu lockdown, mostly peaceful protest price of $642.99. By comparison, that same upper on the same website today would only set you back about $300. The shiny stainless steel barrel on that new upper had no tactical advantage, so by the time I invested in a six-color Duracoat job, I had essentially bought that rifle twice. The end result was a really good rifle with a really good trigger that worked really well and did everything that I wanted it to do. So what's the problem? Much like the used car market, there is a considerable amount of risk involved in buying a used gun. Suppose you bought a second-hand car, assuming that it ran and drove, only to find out that before you could get it home, you were going to have to replace everything under the hood in order to make it run right. That was kind of the position I was in with this 308. The long story short with that one was by the time I had it right, I was so frustrated and aggravated with it that I really didn't want anything to do with it. Somebody came along and decided they needed it worse than I did, and I was glad to see it go. I wish them well. I hope it'll work for them for a long time. I have no doubt in my mind that it will, and in the event that they found something wrong with it, I would be the first person to try to help them make it right. But that's kind of where I'm at with that one. So I'll leave you on this note, folks. 
If you don't have your integrity, there's not much you do have. If you have something like a gun that doesn't work right, instead of just passing it on to some other poor sap, be straight with them. Let them know what they're getting into before they take the plunge. More often than not, they're still going to be willing to do something with it. But it adds a little credibility to what it is that you're doing in the first place. So I'll get down off the soapbox and turn it over to you folks so that you can let me know in the comment section down below about the one that you bought that drove you crazy and you couldn't wait to get rid of. Until next time, take care. God bless.